After the two Harrys killed him, a rumour started among the children that Peter Manuel could see in the dark. Monday, 2nd of December, 1957. He knows too much to be an honest man, but says he wants to help. He says he can get the gun for them. William Watt is keen to meet him. Lawrence Dowdle has already met Peter Manuel several times. He never wants to see him again. Dowdle parks his beige Bentley on a dark city street and gets out. Watt is waiting on the pavement, next to his maroon Vauxhall Velox. It's early evening in early December. Glasgow's wet and dark, but still warm. The bitterness of winter has yet to bite. Above the roofs, every chimney belches black smoke. Rain drags smut down over the city like a mourning mantilla. Soon a Clean Air Act will outlaw coal burning in town. Five square miles of the Victorian city will be ruled unfit for human habitation and torn down, redeveloped in concrete and glass and steel. 130,000 homes will be demolished in the biggest urban redevelopment project in post-war Europe. But this story is before all of that. This story happens in the old boom city. Crowded, wild west, chaotic. In the street, Dowdle falls into step with Watt, walking towards a doorway below a red neon sign, Whitehall's Restaurant Lounge. Watt is tall and stout and bald, dressed in bourgeois yellow tweeds and a heavy wool overcoat. Dowdle is slim, dark, moustachioed. He's Watt's lawyer. He wears a sharp, dark suit under an exquisitely cut camel hair. They go through the door to Whitehall's and take a steep set of narrow stairs up. Watt can see the stitching on the back of Dowdle's shoes. Handmade, Watt thinks. Italian. Watt wants a Bentley too, and Italian shoes, but he needs to put this burn side affair behind him first. This is why they're going to meet a man who was released from prison three days ago. They're going to find the gun and solve the crime. Peter Manuel wrote to Dowdle, saying he had information about the Burnside murders. A lot of prisoners did, but Manuel's letters were different. Most came from chancers who wanted money. Some were from creeps who wanted details. Manuel didn't ask for anything, except the chance to meet William Watt face to face. Odd. Dowdle stops three steps from the top and leans back, whispering over his shoulder. If he asks you for money, William, refuse, point blank. Watt grunts. Dowdle already warned him about this back at the office. Any evidence they get from Manuel will be useless if money changes hands. But Watt is desperate, and he's a businessman. He knows you don't get something for nothing. Whitehall's restaurant isn't a fancy joint. It's a second best suit, a fair with your secretary type of place. Near the door, a big blonde and a small man are hunched over grey pork chops. At another table, a trio of tipsy, dishevelled salesmen chat quietly. The only customer who didn't look up when they come in is reading a newspaper in the lounge bar. He's the man who knows too much. He's alone. Freshly shaven, Peter Manuel looks smart in his sports jacket and tie. His thick hair is combed back from his face. William Watt is surprised by how respectable he looks. He knows all about Manuel's record from Dowdle. The rapes, the prison terms, the incessant housebreaking. On the table in front of Manuel sit an empty whisky glass and a half pint with a finger of beer left in it. A half and half, the druthy gent's refreshment. Watt is pleased when he sees that, because he really, really wants a good drink. He wants it quickly, and in truth, he wants it all the time. The two men tack their way across the room. The blonde with the port chops recognises Lawrence Dowdle. Dowdle's a celebrity, Glasgow's foremost criminal lawyer, often in the papers. 
She whispers to her companion, and he turns for a gop. Manuel does not stand up to meet them, but sits belligerently as they dock at his table. Dowdle affects the introductions. No one attempts to shake hands. Watt and Manuel are in no way similar. They look as if they're in different stories altogether. If this were a movie, William Watt would be in an ailing comedy. Six foot two in an age of small men, he's ungainly, rotund and balding. He's fifty and looks like an actor playing a bumbling authority figure in a gentle comedy of manners. Peter Manuel's in a very different film. His would be European, black and white, directed by Clouseau or Melville and shown in art house cinemas. There wouldn't be violence or gore in the movie, but the implication of threat is always there. Short and solidly built, at five foot six, Manuel has the rough hue and good looks of Robert Mitchum. He's thirty. His eyebrows are heavy, his lips quite broad and sensual. He wears his black hair brill creamed back from his square face. The smartness of his dress is often remarked upon, and he's confident of the impression he makes on women. He always insists they be allowed to serve on the juries at his trials. They pull back chairs to sit down. To Watt's dismay, Dowdle takes his overcoat off. He means to stay, but what was clear back in Dowdle's office, he said he wants to talk to Manuel alone. He thought it was agreed, but realises now that the answer Dowdle gave him wasn't definitive. You may have been in prison, Bill, but you don't know these people, not really. Dowdle became almost tearful. Bill, some of these men don't seem to be of this world. These people are stained. Their very souls are tainted. Dowdle is blatantly Roman Catholic. Most Catholics have the manners to disguise their leanings when they're in mixed company, but Dowdle doesn't. He doesn't have a crucifix up in his office or ostentatiously named drop priests or monsignors the way some aggressive Catholics do. But his everyday conversation makes oblique references to souls and stains and good and bad. The maitre d' takes their order. Dowdle orders a Johnny Walker and soda. Watt orders a half and half for himself and another for Mr Manuel. He does it graciously. Manuel doesn't thank him, but nods lightly, as if to say, yes, that's something he will allow. Dowdle and Manuel light cigarettes, one a Turkish hand-rolled from a wooden box, one a stubby piccadilly from a crumpled paper packet. Dowdle smokes quickly, nervously. They avoid eye contact. Do you take a smoke, Mr Watt? Manuel pushes his scrawny packet of smokes across the table with his fingertips and Watt takes a cigarette. Manuel offers him a light from a matchbook. It's red and yellow, a promotional matchbook from Jackson's Bar. Jackson's Bar is a gangster pub in the Gorbals. It is a very specific clientele of suited men on the make. It's not for whorish women or clapped-out hard men. No one wants the cops in there. With jobs being arranged, deals getting done, and connections being made. Manuel sees Watt read the matchbook. Their eyes meet, and they both understand. That part of the city is as small as a midge's oxter. They probably know a lot of the same people. Watt is sure he can do good business with Manuel, if they could only get rid of Dowdle. The waiter arrives with the tray of drinks. They all watch in silence as he puts them on the table and takes the money from Watt. As the waiter saunters away, Dowdle concerns himself with his scotch. Manuel widens his eyes at Watt. Watt frowns. Manuel juts his chin, telling Watt to begin. But Watt doesn't know what to begin. Manuel looks at the salesman the couple, the passing maitre d', and then eyes Dowdle. He smirks at Watt. Dowdle is a public man. He has a reputation to lose. Watt understands what Manuel means. He nearly smiles, but Manuel warns him not to with a little shake of his head. No, no, don't smile. Just 
begin. So, Watt says loudly, Manuel, if I find out that you had anything to do with the Burnside affair, why, I will tear your arms off, sir. The room holds its breath. Manuel shouts back, Nobody does that to Manuel. Now no one in the restaurant is speaking. The couple stare at their plates, thrilled. The salesmen have drawn in tight round their table. The maitre d' is watching, frightened, because it's down to him to break it up if they start throwing punches. And Dowdle, respectable, well-kent Dowdle, has suddenly got a very itchy arse. He's writhing in his chair but resists the urge to run. Watt is delighted by how clever they've been, spotting this weakness in Dowdle's resolve. He leans across the table. Manuel, see here, before we begin, let me make myself abundantly clear, right from the off. No, you talk too much, pal. Manuel's tone is a prison promise of a fight coming. He leans slowly in to meet Watt. Dowdle puts his hand on the table, calling an end to the round by tapping a finger on the tabletop. Tap, tap, tap. He asks Manuel if he has information for Mr Watt. With an unblinking nod, Manuel concedes that he does. Dowdle asks, will he give Mr Watt the information? A nod. Does the information pertain to the murders at Burnside? Aye. Manuel gives a careless shrug. Sure he says, as if it's nothing, as if it's not the murder of three members of Watt's family and the sex attack of his 17-year-old daughter. Dowdle nods for Manuel to begin, but Manuel doesn't speak. He has a stubby pencil in his hand. He scribbles something in the margin of his newspaper and pushes it across to Watt. Newspaper men, it says, as one word. He nods at the table of salesmen, who are now watching plates of gam and steak and potatoes being delivered by the waiter. Manuel writes again, not here. It's bullshit, and bad bullshit at that. Those men are not journalists. Dowdle draws a breath, his face sceptical. He's about to say it's nonsense, but suddenly Manuel snarls a loud animal growl at what. Dowdle is on his feet. His coat is over his arm. The Bentley key is in his hand. He empties his glass of whiskey and soda in one smooth move, stepping away from the table with a little bow. Gentlemen, he says, meaning quite the reverse. He squeezes Watt's shoulder as he passes. A warning. Be careful. They're alone. Watt means to begin by sounding friendly, hoping the evening will remain collegiate in tone. Well, chief, he says, you handled that scenario very nicely, I must say. I'm agreeably surprised to meet you. Manuel blows a thick stream of cigarette smoke and narrows his eyes. We've got a lot to talk about. Watt smiles pleasantly and toasts his new friend. Oh, we most certainly have. The night together has begun. The Long Drop by Denise Minor was read by Liam Brennan and abridged by Sean Priest. The producer was Ailey McCready. And tomorrow, William Watt's lawyer takes to the stand. Wednesday, 14th of May, 1958. It is nearly six months later and Peter Manuel is on trial for eight murders, these include the Smart family, 17-year-old Isabel Cook, and the three Watt women. Seven of the murders are in pursuit of theft. If he's found guilty of any one of them, he will be hanged. The eighth, the murder of Anne Neelands back in December 1956, is not in pursuit of theft. It's a lesser charge. In the court, every single seat is taken. On the ground floor are the press benches, print journalists and reporters for the wireless. Manuel is in the dock right in front of these seats. Upstairs there are 60 balcony seats, all taken by women. 
The only empty seats are on the bench next to Lord Cameron. Lawrence Dowdle climbs up to the witness box and gives Lord Cameron a small, respectful bow, sans eye contact. Dowdle knows every lawyer in this room, personally and professionally, but he oughtn't to bring those connections in here, where he's a prosecution witness. He's sworn in. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. Dowdle is a storyteller. He knows how slippery truth is. The only part of the oath that Dowdle sincerely means is, so help me God. He really means that part. The advocate deputy, Mr M. G. Gillies, stands up and asks Mr Dowdle if he can please tell the court how he came to meet Mr Manuel in connection with the murders at Burnside. It's an ideal introduction to the story Dowdle wants to tell. And so he begins. Dowdle began representing Mr William Watt while he was remanded in Berlini for the murders of his wife, his daughter and his sister-in-law, Mrs Margaret Brown. Mr Watt was very upset. He'd been charged with appalling crimes. He'd been in all of the newspapers day after day and now he found himself in prison. The police were convinced of his guilt. Were you? All of the lawyers in the room shift uncomfortably at that question. Dowdle answers, Well, of course, legally, I wouldn't be able to represent anyone as innocent if I knew they were guilty. He feels gratitude radiating towards him from the lawyers. He has nimbly saved them all. Mr Watt knew that whoever killed his family was still out there and might strike again, so he became a, a detective, if you will. How did he go about that? He let it be known, through me, that he was investigating the Burnside affair and would be receptive to anyone with information. And did people come forward with information? They did. Peter Manuel was mentioned by several people in connection with the incident. But it wasn't until I received a letter from Mr Manuel that we took those rumours seriously. Dowdle must not mention that Manuel wrote to him from prison. That would be prejudicial. What did Mr Manuel's letters say? Dowdle has to step very carefully here. Manuel asked him to visit and act as his lawyer. Strictly speaking, Dowdle is bound by client-lawyer confidentiality and shouldn't be telling anyone what was said. Mr Manuel sent me a letter concerning one matter, but in an addendum stated that he had information concerning Mr Watt. Do you still have this letter? I am afraid it was not kept. The letter is damning for Dowdle. It's clear Manuel is inviting him to visit in his capacity as his legal representative. He wanted Dowdle to put in a hopeless application for bail. And so you went to see Mr Manuel? I did. Mr Manuel told me that Mr Watt was innocent. He said he knew the man who had really committed the murders. The public benches gasp. The jury scribble in their notepads. And what did you say to Mr Manuel? I told Mr Manuel that the lack of details made me conclude that his story was not credible. And then I left. Did you see Mr Manuel again? Yes. I received yet another letter from him. He said he had additional information, so I went to see him for a second time. Dowdle remembers this meeting as he recounts the story of it. He doesn't have to be on guard because he didn't go as Manuel's lawyer this time. Peter Manuel sits at a table in a prison interview room, looking up at Dowdle through thick eyebrows. They deal with the preliminaries. Then Manuel leans towards him and says, I know who done it, the Watt murders, and it wasn't William Watt. Dowdle draws him out. Yes, you said that before. I've been hearing all sorts from all quarters. Manuel smirks. Is it details you want? As he speaks, his hands tell the story too. The man crept along the dark street to the house. He's broke the glass panel at the left-hand side of the front door. He's reached in. Manuel slides his hand towards Dowdle as if he's in the dark street, breaking in right now. 
He's let his cell into the hall with the chiffonier on the left and a picture of a yellow dog hanging above it. He shut the door after himself. On the wall, he lifts his right hand, thumb and forefinger pinched. A key rack, but there's no keys hanging there. He's walked on through the dark house. He pushes open the bedroom door and there's two beds, twin beds and two women in them. He's took out his gun and he's shot both the women in the head. Just there. He screws the tip of his forefinger into his temple and he stood looking at them for a bit. But then he's heard the girl. Dowdle sees a spark of glee in Manuel's eyes. He's reliving the story through the telling and he's enjoying it. She's in another room. So he's left the two women bleeding and gone down the hall to the girl's bedroom door. She's opened the door and his face is just there and oh! She's jumped back into the room. Now he's not a cruel man, this man I'm talking about. He doesn't want to hurt a young girl. Dowdle knows about Manuel's rape charges. The rape stretched back to the age of 14. Manuel has a thing about the women's heads. He bludgeons, punches the head, threatens the head. He didn't want to hurt a young girl, so he gives her a knockout punch in the jaw, KO. Now he didn't know what to do. But he's hungry, so he's went into the kitchen and he fixed his cell a wee sandwich to eat, with gammon. He'd no sooner done that when he heard the girl again. She's woke up, she's cried out. He went back in there and he shot her too and she fell in a corner. Then he stood there, smoked a couple of fags, went into the front room, took a swig of gin from the bottle on the dresser, mascaro dry gin. Dowdle is damp with sweat. One might wonder though, he says quietly, if it was this other man, how it is that you know so many details. Ah, oh, see this man, breezes Manuel. He's came to me just after, like the morning after, and... Manuel stops. He stops for too long, staring at the tabletop, and then he's back. He's destroyed by what he's done. He's in the horrors. Hide this gun for me, he says. So I took it, and I hid it, and I can get it again. The gun has never been found. Manuel is offering a piece of concrete, physical evidence that could prove Mr Watt is innocent. Can you describe this gun? Manuel smirks. I'll go one better. I'll draw it. Dowdle gives him paper and a pencil, and he does draw it. It is quite a good drawing of a Webley revolver. May I take this drawing? Manuel seems flattered. Sure, why not? Dowdle slips the drawing in among his papers. He can't legally take away any communications by a prisoner unless he's their lawyer. He stands up to leave. Uh, Did you put in my bail application then? Manuel's eyes slide from the papers to Dowdle and a sly smile creeps across his face. Dowdle freezes. The bail application was pointless and Manuel knows that. But if Dowdle answers Manuel's question, this becomes a client-lawyer interview. Legally, Dowdle will not be able to repeat what Manuel has just told him. However, he will be able to take the drawing of the gun out of the prison perfectly legally. Dowdle senses that Manuel fully understands the position he's put him in. The point of the bail application was never the bail itself, but putting Dowdle in this quandary. Manuel has done this deliberately. Dowdle picks up his papers. He means to say, I'm not here about that. He thinks to say, we will discuss this another time. But his mouth disobeys him. Yes. Shocked at himself, he turns and walks out. Dowdle doesn't tell this part in court. This part makes all of his testimony invalid. M.G. Gillies hands a sheet of paper labelled Crown Production 41 up to the witness dock. 
And is this the type of gun that was used to kill Mrs. Watt, Vivian Watt and Mrs. Brown? They all know it is. The actual Webley is sitting right there, in front of them, on the evidence table. Uh, so I understand, says Dowdle, adding, and it has a particularity. You'll notice that the lanyard ring is missing in the sketch and on the actual gun. Did you go to the police with this information, Mr. Dowdle? I did. They went to the Manuel family home in Birkinshaw and they searched the garden. Why? They were looking for the gun he had drawn or the missing lanyard ring. M.G. Gillies asks, Did you meet Mr. Manuel again? Manuel wrote that he was being released and he could get the gun back, but he wanted to meet Mr. Watt first. We met him at Whitehall's restaurant, but I'd left after just ten minutes. But Watt and Manuel stayed there, together. I believe they were together all night, until six o'clock the next morning. What happened that night, Mr. Dowdle? I really don't know. We never discussed it. There is a pause. This seems implausible, but Dowdle is obviously telling the truth. William Watt will be asked his version of events when he's on the stand tomorrow. M.G. Gillies flounders and says, Thank you, Mr. Dowdle. From the corner of his eye, Dowdle can see Manuel leaning forward in the dock to whisper to his lawyer. Manuel knew that Dowdle's confidentiality had been breached, that he had committed a crime. He's the only one who knows. He could have used these facts to exclude Dowdle's testimony. Dowdle doesn't understand why Manuel hasn't instructed his lawyers to do that. He set up this complicated play and then forgot, or neglected, to use it to his advantage. Or maybe he means to use it to ruin Dowdle, rather than save his own neck from the noose. Even with eight murder charges hanging over him, six of which are for the murder of women, one for a ten-year-old child, even with the nastiness of them known, Dowdle feels that he alone has any understanding of how profoundly malevolent Peter Manuel is. The Long Drop by Denise Minor was read by Liam Brennan, abridged by Sean Priest and produced by Ailey McCready. And tomorrow at the same time, a lawyer struggles under cross-examination and details emerge about William Watt and Peter Manuel's evening together. BBC Radio 4's award-winning thriller series returns. Attention, heroes. You have a mission. An immersive online game spills into the real world. Welcome to Reality 2.0. What's wrong with actual reality? Wednesday, 14th of May, 1958. For the entire three-week trial, the viewing public have been almost exclusively women. No one knows why. The women queue overnight, every night, settling down on the pavement with blankets on their knees. The newspapers speculate. Are they here for love? Manuel is handsome. Are they here for blood? The crimes are horrific. Is it because Manuel seems powerful to them? It is a proven scientific fact that women are attracted to power, to being dominated. It is 1958, and a husband has the legal right to rape and beat his wife. That's a private matter, a matter for the home. The journalists ask the women why they're here. The women say they seek justice, they seek truth, they feel for the victims, hollow phrases that might well be lifted from the papers. But in the queue, they're all excited and giggly. The papers print photographs of smiling gangs of chirpy gal pals toasting the reader with tea from flasks. Inside, the bustling court smells of sour sweat, cigarettes and damp overcoats. And now, Manuel's defence counsel stands up. William Grieve. Grieve only took silk last year and his act is not polished. Harold Leslie is the senior QC in Manuel's team and he should have cross-examined Dowdle. 
But Harold was representing William Watt when he was charged with these murders. Dowdle had instructed him, so there is a conflict of interest which requires him to step aside. Grieve looks up, flashes a joyless smile at Dowdle. Might I ask about this other matter on which you initially went to visit Mr. Manuel? Manuel smirks. This is what he was whispering about. Dowdle knows that the jury will stop listening if he makes it sound complicated enough. He must not say that Manuel was in prison or mention any of his previous convictions. Mr. Manuel had requested an interview with a view to a minor revision of the conditions of a legal application. Grieve nods. He had, in short, sought your legal expertise. Yes. And it was in that first interview, when you were in effect acting as his lawyer, that he sketched the gun for you. No, that was at the second meeting. At the first meeting, he told me that William Watt was an innocent man, and he knew the man who had actually committed the murders. It's a rudimentary mistake. Grieve hasn't done a timeline. Ah, yes, I see. Well, thank you for that correction, Mr Dowdle, but in the first interview, you were acting as his lawyer. Manuel is crossing and uncrossing his legs. He wants certain things asked in certain ways, and Grieve is busy getting dates wrong. No, he was my client for the first half of the interview. In the second half of the first interview, I was there in my capacity as Mr Watt's representative, as I was at all subsequent meetings. That is arguable, says Grieve, but he seems to have given up. As a closer, he asks, Mr Dowdle, was any money exchanged between Mr. Watt and Mr. Manuel for this information? Dowdle has rehearsed this. Well, I left after ten minutes, but I do know this. I told Mr. Watt not to give Peter Manuel any money for the information. All it will take is one more move. Did William Watt ever talk about giving Manuel money? And Dowdle will have to say yes, he did. We discussed it. But Dowdle looks up and he sees relief shimmer across Greaves' face. He sees Manuel glare at the back of Greaves' head. And he knows that deep down, Greaves loathes Peter Manuel too. He wants him dead too. That will be all, Mr Dowdle, thank you. Thank you, Mr Greave. Thank you. Monday, 2nd of December, 1957. I killed my wife. William Ward is murmuring in Peter Manuel's ear. Then the door opens. He looks up and shouts, Scout, o' oh bloody Neil! They're in Jackson's bar. They've been there for a while. Watt is very drunk. Manuel has matched him drink for drink, but he isn't very drunk. Manuel doesn't get drunk, not in the usual way. His body becomes uncoordinated. He may feel sleepy, but his basic mood doesn't change. They're standing together in the prime spot in Jackson's, at the corner of the long bar. Bar positioning in Jackson's is a complex language, a poem about power. From the corner of the bar, Watt and Manuel can see the whole room and both doors. Everyone coming through the door sees them first and picks up on their mood. Manuel and Watt don't belong together. It throws everyone. Eyes flick between them, confused by their conjoining and therefore disadvantaged. They are just intoxicated by it, euphoric, talking fast and loose. Watt is saying things to Manuel he wouldn't otherwise. I killed my wife. When they are interrupted by the sight of Scout O'Neill, staggering in through the door. O'Neill shouldn't even be in here. He's a ridiculous mess tonight. He stands at the door, two black eyes and the bridge of his nose swollen and split, his suit jacket ripped on the shoulder. Even O'Neill knows he's not getting served tonight. He's just looking for someone, probably someone that owes him money from the Gordon Club. Watt calls his name. Scout, o' oh bloody Neil. 
Scout hears it and raises a hand while he scans the bar for the debtor's face. Scout O'Neill catches the manager's eye. Brady, a surly big bastard, is drying ashtrays at the gantry but is stopped still, staring at O'Neill. They both know Scout can't be in here with that face, in that suit, with blood on it. Scout brasses it out and sidesteps to what? Couple of minutes, Brady. Brady shakes his head and mutters a warning, not happy. But O'Neill has two minutes' grace. Hey, what? You seen Dandy the night? Scout is scanning the faces for his boss, Dandy Mackay, so he doesn't see the reaction to his question. He looks round to see if Watt has heard him, and then he sees Peter Manuel standing next to William Watt. Scout is aghast. The fuck he's doing? Scout runs his eye between them, sees that Watt and Manuel are not just together. They're making a show of being together, and they're doing it in Jackson's, of all fucking places. The fuck he's pulling? He shakes his head at Manuel. You better fucking run, boy. If I was you, I'd fucking run. Manuel smirks. Hey, Scout, gonna no say. William Watt is oblivious. He's picked up on none of this. A drink for O'Neill. Scout holds both hands up, not in surrender. He's washing his hands of them. The door flaps open to the night. Watt tries to blink away a sudden sting of cigarette smoke. The door flaps shut. Watt's eyes open, and Scout O'Neill is gone. Watt barely remembers that O'Neill was even there. He goes back to what he was saying before. I killed my wife, they say. I suppose anyone might kill their wife. But her sister? Why would I? Who would? And my daughter? Watt frowns at his drink. Thing is, he whispers in Manuel's ear, if I did that to my daughter, I would certainly have turned the gun on myself. But I didn't, you know. I was fishing. Manuel nods impatiently, stubbing his cigarette out. Soon Dandy Mackay will know that he is with William Watt. Let's get out of here. Watt can't believe what's being proposed. Why go somewhere else? I like it here. Come on. Outside, in the December night, Manuel is walking down Crown Street. He's drunk a lot and his legs are moving faster than he means them to. He's fallen forwards, catching his weight with the next step. Big tall Watt catches up effortlessly and asks him where he's going. Manuel finds he can't speak. He says, and staggers off down the pavement. They're in the gorbals, on a main road with churches and shops and ramshackle, crumbling tenements. They slow and stop. They're both unbelievably tired all of a sudden. Manuel sees them both as if from far away. Two drunk men sagging in Crown Street. Small drunk, big drunk. Wants money, has money. Knows something, wants to know. Give me money, he blurts at Watt. Watt considers his petition. He raises his hands and sighs. Haven't got any. But he has. They both know he has. Got the gun? I've got. I'll get, says Manuel. Watt looks at the wall next to him. It's a black tenement and the stone is crumbling. Gang slogans and graffiti are scratched into the soft surface. This, Watt turns and sweeps a panoramic hand over the street. Gone. All gone. Big money. Manuel nods, knocking it down. Really big money. Ten years, all gone. He sees that Manuel isn't interested in land development scams. Manuel should be. They'll cost him his life. When the city is flattened and being rebuilt with bathrooms and plumbing and kitchens, 
Money will be scammed on the materials and the labour. But what is in on the meta scam? This pleases him enormously. Big money. He spins on his heel. Monte the car. They stagger down to Watts Maroon Vauxhall, parked outside Jackson's. Watt can't find the key. He finds the key. Now they're both in the car. Now the doors are shut. They're both looking out of the windscreen at Jackson's. Yellow light spills into black night. I know who killed your wife and daughter. I know you do. Will you tell me? Manuel sighs. It isn't a drunken sigh. It's a different kind of a sigh. You know who did it. What nods and slumps, his forehead resting on the backs of his hands on the steering wheel. Manuel mutters in the background, You need a Joe. I've got one. A right good fit. Watt is confused for a moment. He doesn't need a Joe. I, I just want the gun, he says. Manuel nods as if that's what they were discussing anyway. And I'm the boy who knows where it is. Watt can finally see an end to this nightmare. It won't be easy, but he's sure he was right to meet this terrible man. Fortune favours the brave. I know where it is, slurs Manuel, but I'm going to need money. In the dark car, Watt says, I have money. I can get money. Manuel nods. All right then. Let's go. William Watt faces the music when Liam Brennan reads the next part of The Long Drop by Denise Miner tomorrow night at half past nine. It was abridged by Sean Priest and the producer was Ailey McCready. This is BBC Radio 4 Extra. Now on 4 Extra, it's time for the next part of The Dead Hour, our crime drama that's set in Glasgow in the 1980s. Patricia Paddy Meehan is a reporter who was at the scene of a murder. She's also accepted a bribe. The Long Drop, which is Denise Miner's first foray into true crime. The award-winning author reimagines the trial of Scotland's first serial killer, Peter Manuel, in a dark and compelling exploration of truth and storytelling. Today, the businessman William Watt takes to the stand. Thursday, 15th of May, 1958. Watt is being carried into Glasgow High Court on a stretcher. He crashed his car in the Gorbals last night. The police have charged him with drunk driving. And this is not the first time. When the case comes to court, he'll lose his licence. At the witness stand, Watt is let down and hauls himself up the steps. Flinching, he raises his hand to be sworn in and repeats the oath with ludicrous solemnity. M.G. Gillies asks, and this is the story Watt tells. It was a Sunday night, the second week of his annual fly-fishing holiday. His wife Marion is recovering from a heart operation, so he's alone, staying at the Cairnban Hotel, a 90-mile drive from Glasgow. He spends the Sunday night in the residence lounge. Mr Watt, Mr and Mrs Leach, who own the hotel, and a fishing chum, Mr Bruce, have quite a party. They drink for five or six hours until 1am when they roll up to their beds. Watt is next seen at 8am in the dining room for breakfast. After breakfast, Watt goes fishing. A while later, a taxi arrives at the river bank. The driver beckons him over. Mrs Leach needs to see him urgently. A sobbing Mrs Leach meets him at the door. She tells him, your brother John telephoned from Glasgow. Journalists came into the baker's shop asking strange questions about you. John phoned the police to find out what was going on. They said, your wife is dead. Your daughter is dead. Your sister-in-law is dead. Killed in your house. Shot with a gun. In their beds. 
William keeps shaking his head. No. No, this is a mistake. My wife, Marion? It's wrong. There weren't three people at my house last night. My sister-in-law wasn't at my house last night. I called home yesterday evening and Vivian told me specifically that she would stay the night with Diana Valenti next door. This is all wrong. A police officer drives Watt and Mr Bruce in Watt's car to Glasgow and here Watt's troubles begin because here he meets D.S. Mitchell. D.S. Mitchell finds him very strange. Watt smiles abruptly, keeps announcing that he's fine and is angry at the police for making a huge mistake. Mitchell becomes suspicious of Watt and makes notes of some of the things he says. You won't see me shed a single tear. You don't think I did it, do you? I know this road like the back of my hand. For the defence, William Grieve asks Watt if he made these statements because he had a guilty conscience. Watt announces to the court, My conscience has never been guilty all of my life. I never did a wrong thing in all my life. Watt is asked about extramarital dalliances and, shamefaced, admits to several lapses. To take the bad look off him, Gillies asks about Marion's heart operation, as though a sick wife is by necessity a cuckolded wife. Men have needs. M.G. Gillies asks him if it is possible, as the defence have suggested, for what to drink for six hours in the residence lounge and then drive 90 miles to Glasgow, kill his family, drive the 90 miles back in the same night without detection. Watt declares, Oh, you couldn't drive. Never could you drive. No one believes him. But the police find the Vauxhall petrol tank is full, minus what it took to drive back to Glasgow in the morning. It should be missing three times that much petrol if he drove home, murdered everyone and got back to the Cairn Ban before breakfast. The round trip is done and timed at five hours, but the test was done during the day. Watt would have done it in the dark, on unlit, potholed roads. Watt would also have had to cross the River Clyde. The Renfrew Ferry is erratic at night. Realistically, the drive would have taken much longer than five hours. The police start to doubt that Watt could be responsible. But then witnesses come forward. A week after the discovery of the bodies, nine men stand in a line-up in Rutherglen Police Station. William Watt is one of them. The Renfrew ferryman walks along the line-up, peering into faces, looking men up and down. He reaches forward and touches William Watt's hand. This is the man. He hisses, this is the man. But the ferryman is a bad witness in court. He keeps calling the car the Wolseley, which is a very different looking car from a Vauxhall. He comes over as an attention seeker who's never off the phone to the police about suspicious passengers. The evidence is thin, but the police never stop believing what is responsible. They're not looking for anyone else. M.G. Gillis asks, Six months later, you met Mr. Manuel in early December 1957 in Whitehalls? Yes. Though you were by now convinced that Manuel had killed your family, you were willing to spend an entire evening in his company? What other option did I have? Mr. Dowdle informed me that Manuel knew where the gun was and I was trying to get that for the police. Watt turns stiffly to the jury. I didn't know what else to do, he says. Grieve gets up for the defence. He makes Watt go over the night with Manuel again and again. What did they talk about during the night? Well, Manuel said he had the gun and then told Watt that the people who committed the murders had made a mistake. They actually meant to kill and rob the Valentes next door but Manuel knew practically every stick of furniture in the Fensbank Avenue house. He even knew what sort of gin they had. Abruptly, Grieve asks Watt if he has bad feet. Yes, Watt says wearily, 
He admits to having three corns, though he fails to see how this is relevant. Did you tell D.S. Mitchell that you had been cutting your corns in the hotel room in Cairnban before you came to Glasgow that day? Yes, I did tell him that. And this was to explain why you had blood in your hands, under your fingernails. Yes, what dabs his forehead. You were brought back to the hotel on an urgent matter. You were told that your family had all been shot dead and you must go immediately to Glasgow to identify their bodies. Yet then you went off to cut your corns? I don't recall. Grief finishes Watt's torment with a final flick of the whip. Did you kill your family, Mr Watt? Watt waves a hand in the air and announces, What a profession! What a profession! Does he mean lawyering is an odd profession? Or that Grieve is wrong when he professes that Watt killed his family? No one knows. But the statement is widely reported as an example of how odd Mr Watt sounded on the stand. As he's helped down from the witness box, Watt thinks his part in this case is over. It isn't. Monday, 2nd of December, 1957. William Watt hasn't quite worked out what to do yet. There are a number of possibilities, but he's befuddled with the drink. He can't think them through to the final play. One wrong move could be catastrophic. Watt has money. He has cash stashed all over the place, in his house, in each of his five bakery shops. He can pay Manuel, but Manuel's a career criminal. If he does give Manuel money, he has to be careful. Watt doesn't want him to know where his money is. Briefly, he considers getting money from his girlfriend, Femi. He has £200 in her flat. But if he went there, Manuel might go back later and attack her. Watt knows Manuel's history, about the girls he's forced himself on. He's not sure how to handle the gun. He needs to get Manuel to tell him where it is. Needs a witness to him saying it. And then he needs to get the police to go and get it from there themselves. Unless Manuel has it on him now, in which case he mustn't touch it. It's all too complicated for someone as drunk as he is, and he's trying to drive as well. He makes a decision. He'll take Manuel to his brother John over in Brigton. John will be sober. John will witness Manuel telling William where the gun is. He glances at his watch. It's ten to ten. Too early. John will still be finishing the books. Watt needs to play for time. He draws over to the curb and parks. Why'd you stop? says Manuel. Watt nods across the road. Swift one in the steps bar. An oily smog of cigarette smoke hangs in the public bar of the steps. Four or five men sit alone at tables. Watt orders half and halves. The wiry, weathered barman has a grubby black apron and steel suspenders on his sleeves. Watt winks at him. Make the scotch doubles. He looks at Manuel, expecting him to be pleased, but Manuel rolls his eyes. Watt, don't think you can get me drunk. I can pour this stuff down my neck all night. The drinks arrive. Watt drinks half of his beer, and then drops his shot glass into it. It's a silly thing to do, childish, a way of making the drink more fun. Watt looks at Manuel's drink. Go on, drink that. Manuel leaves a pause, looking around the bar, making it clear that he isn't drinking because he's been told to by Watt. He is choosing to drink. He looks at Watt and mouths one word. Money. A draft from the street hits them at the same time. They turn to look at the door. Shifty Thompson skulks into the lounge. Shifty's wide-legged grey slacks hang precariously from his bony hips. His jacket is a loud blue check. He heads straight for Watt and Manuel. He doesn't need to look for them. He knows exactly where they're standing. Shifty works for Dandy Mackay. And Watt suddenly realises that the barman called the Gordon Club to say they were in here. 
Dandy must have the whole town looking for them. Shifty Thompson rubs his nose. Danny's saying he's if to get to club. Shifty never looks you in the eye when he speaks. Uh, might one inquire, Shifty, of the two of us, whom are you addressing? Shifty sucks his cheeks in. Manuel. He looks at the ceiling. Dandy's at Gordon. You've tea up there, pronto. Shifty reels away abruptly. Three big strides and he's at the door. And then he's gone. Manuel sucks violently on his cigarette, empties his whiskey into his mouth, swallows, and only then breathes out a long stream of smoke through his nostrils. As he exhales, Watt sees his eyes dart this way, that way, looking for the angles, for a way out. You going? Manuel shakes his head, but they both know he has to go. Dandy Mackay ordered it. Watt looks at the barman who flinches. Did you call the Gordon? The barman shrugs and whispers, We was told we had to. Everybody's been told. Watt can't quite believe it. Everybody. He knows how powerful Dandy Mackay is. He knows the weaselly barman had no choice, but still, Watt is frightened and he takes it out on him. It stinks in here, he announces to the room. Let's go. The Long Drop by Denise Minor was read by Liam Brennan, abridged by Sean Priest, and produced by Ailey McCready. Tomorrow we find out the identity of the killer. And we'll hear more from Denise Minor in just a few moments. This is BBC Radio 4 Extra. And now we continue The Dead Hour by Denise Minor. Set in 1980s Glasgow, our reporter Paddy was at the scene of what later turned out to be a murder. But can she sell her story to her new boss at the paper? scandalised high society by having an affair with both the wife and the daughter of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Her unapologetic and fascinating life will be revealed in Monsters of Music with Tom Allen next week at the same time. This is BBC Radio 4 Extra. The Long Drop is Denise Miner's first foray into true crime, in which the award-winning author reimagines the trial of Scotland's first serial killer, Peter Manuel, in a dark and compelling exploration of truth and storytelling. Today, a killer is about to be revealed as Watt and Manuel struggle to stay one step ahead of a feared gangster. Monday, 2nd of December, 1957. In the street, struck by the cold once again, they stop and Manuel lifts his jacket collar. Watt looks down at him. He needs to sort this out. What's it going to take for me to get the gun? Manuel says, I've got a Joe. Take him, then I'll give you the gun. Bastard called Charles Tallis. Record as long as your arm. Watt shakes his head. It's not believable. Not even to someone who wants to believe it. Manuel sneers. Talis told me the whole thing was a mistake. He was after the Valentes next door. Watt is instantly sober. The story could work. It may be more believable than the truth. And really, what difference does it make if it's Manuel or someone else? He's a conversation away from the whole bloody mess being over. But Dandy Mackay is after Manuel. Seriously after him. What needs to get this story resolved before Dandy gets him? Let's go and see my brother John. They drive to John's flat in a close in Gathlin Street in Deniston. The door opens. 
John is a slim version of William, the youngest of the three Watt brothers. He doesn't like the look of Manuel. Why are you here, Bill? Self-conscious, Watt raises a straight arm at his side. John, this is Peter Manuel. He knows who did the murders. He's going to tell us what happened and how we can get the gun. And to get money, adds Manuel. John looks at William. You seem quite drunk, Bill. Watt is embarrassed by that and laughs. We, we just need to hear his story. John shrugs. Nettie, John's wife, is in the warm kitchen. The table is set for two. Nettie isn't at all pleased to see William with a drunk stranger in tow. John is making it clear that she's to welcome them, though. Eggs and bacon, he orders, and she scuttles away and puts the frying pan on. They sit around the kitchen table in the recess. Nettie and John drink tea with their dinner. Watt opens a bottle of whiskey and pours himself and Peter generous mouthfuls. When they've finished, Nettie washes up and leaves the kitchen. The men stay at the table and Peter Manuel lights a cigarette. John begins. What are you offering? We need more than a good story. Manuel blows smoke over John's head. I'm offering the gun, a named killer. The story and the gun. His name is Charles Tallis and he was after the Valentes. John and Watt look at each other. The story sounds as if it might be plausible. The whole thing was a mistake, begins Manuel. Unseen in the hallway, Nettie leans against a wall and listens. She can hear everything as Manuel tells the story. She hears it sober, with the critical facility of a woman who has spent 35 years at the movies. She knows the difference between a good story and a bad one. Manuel tells them that the Watts were never the intended target. Talis was after the Valentis, an Italian family who lived next door. The war is not long past. Italians are known for keeping cash and jewellery to hand in case they have to run. Charles Talis came to see Manuel the day before he went on the job. He asked to borrow Manuel's Webley revolver to kill the family with. Then he was going to give him the gun back. Sure, said Manuel. No problem. Nettie straightens up. That's wrong. You don't lend a murderer your gun. It can be traced back to you. If Manuel's story was in a movie, the audience would be shouting at the screen now, Rubbish! Go on with ye! Manuel's tone is conspiratorial, so he loans Talis the Webley. Next night, Talis goes to Fensbank Avenue, but he sees Diana Valenti at the window of number five, William Watt's house. He thinks he had the address wrong. This is compelling because Diana was in the Watt house that night. She told the police that she went home at midnight, before the pop parade was finished. Manuel continues. Talis creeps into the quiet house. Everyone is asleep. He stands in the silent hallway, next to the chiffonier with the picture of the yellow dog above it and the empty key rack on the other wall. Empty? asks John, confused. Nettie feels his puzzlement at Manuel knowing that about a house he's never been in. Manuel tells them, Talis opens the door to the first bedroom. There are twin beds, two women sleeping in those beds. Talis draws the gun and shoots the woman nearest the door, shoots her in the temple. Then he shoots the woman furthest away, one bullet in each. Pop, he says. Pop. No one in the kitchen says anything for a moment. But Nettie stands tall. Manuel did it. He's describing what he did. Nettie knows that for sure now. A man who shot three people in their own home. Nettie and John and William are three people. This is their home. She can't leave John in there. But she can't call the police either. 
If they find William with the actual murderer, they'll just arrest William again. They hate him so. John's voice cuts through. Did he describe the girl's room? Well, just a bedroom, a bed, and a pink bedspread. Fluffy. Fluffy? John asks as if he's misheard the word. Nettie feels sure that John knows now. Can I... Chenille, says Manuel. Then he moves straight on to tell them that the girl sees his face there at the door and jumps back into the room. Talis follows her in. There's a struggle. He wants her to get onto the bed and she won't do it. It annoys him, Talis. He gets... He gets annoyed with her. Talis socks her one and she goes down. Then he's hungry, so he goes and makes a sandwich. Gammon. And he drinks from the bottle of Mascaro dry gin. Uh, the one in the drinks cabinet. But he doesn't get to finish his sandwich because the girl wakes up and screams. There is a pause. John shouts, Wife! Wife! Nettie hurries in. John looks up at her imploringly. He knows. He can see that Nettie does too. In a strained voice he says, Might we have some tea, Nettie? Nettie fills the kettle. Would the other two like a cup of tea? Her own voice sounds strange to her. Breathy. Last wordsy. William would like a cup of tea, thank you, dear. Peter Manuel doesn't answer, but announces that he's off to use the cludgy. He goes out, leaving the door ajar. Nettie whispers, Get him out of here, or so help me, I will call the papers. It's an awful threat. They'll be here faster than the police, and they'll make a month's worth of stories out of it. John is livid, but he nods, turns to his brother. Get that bee out of my home. William is not shocked by any of this. Nettie can see that he knew all along. She's never entertained this thought before, but now she wonders if the police are right and William did have a hand in killing his family. The lavatory flushes and Manuel comes in and sits back down. John confronts him. How do you know all these details about the house? Manuel isn't thrown. He says, Listen, next morning, Talis, he came to me, going mad he was. Tells me everything, like in detail, like. He says, hide this gun. William jumps in. Did you? Where? In the Clyde, a special bit. A bit only I know. I can get it back. William keeps talking, as if he's forgotten that the man is a murderer. Listen, even if you have the gun and take it to the police, it fails to clear me of anything. Manuel's voice is a low murmur. Prove something. If Charles Tallis was found shot dead, holding the gun used to kill your family, though, wouldn't it? Clear everything up nicely, that would. Nettie freezes. John gathers a breath to shout, but he's cut off by William scraping his chair bag and standing up. Let's go, Chief. Manuel stays in his seat. Nah, let's stay here. Watt sidles clumsily out of the recess, muttering, There's a club. A wee club, the cellar under the cot bar. Manuel stands up. But what about Dandy? Dandy Mackay? John whispers, his eyes wide with panic. William, are you bloody mad? William doesn't answer. He's smiling awkwardly as he backs away from John. Manuel is at the front door already. The door closes behind them. Nettie turns to see John slump into his seat. Husband, she hisses. I don't want that filthy man in my house ever again. I know, says John. I know. 
neither of them is talking about Peter Manuel. Tuesday, 3rd of December 1957. Watt and Manuel drive away from John and Etty's house and into the night city. It's 3.30 in the morning and the streets are empty. William is contemplative. Uh, they know, I think. Manuel is surprised. Did they say? No, I'm just supposing from the way they looked at you. You don't see what other people think, do you? Says Watt. What you think I read faces wrong? Watt shrugs. Oh! Manuel pulls a crumpled piece of paper out of his pocket. A pound note in my pocket. It wasn't there before I went to the clergy. Maybe you put it in there when I was out the room. It dawns on what. This is a threat. I'll say you gave me money. I'll renege on everything. So he says a mean thing back. You're so obviously guilty, Peter. Anyone could tell it was you. Manuel looks out the window and covers his face with his hand as if he's tired. <sighs> you gonna take the Joe? Charles Tallis? No, if it's a phony baloney suicide scenario. Just take him. I'll get the gun and put it on him. Cops will want him for it. Watt looks out the side window. He thinks meeting Peter was a mistake, after all. Now John and Nettie are suspicious. Dowdle is annoyed. Dandy Mackay will be angry with him. And he's no further forward. But still, the night needn't be a complete washout. Let's go to the court cellar and see what we can see. And the long drop continues after the weekend at this time when the angry Glasgow underworld closes in on William Watt and Peter Manuel. The Long Drop by Denise Minor was read by Liam Brennan, abridged by Sean Priest, and produced by Ailey McCready. And you might like to know that earlier this month, James Nochty was joined by Denise Minor to talk about her book, The Long Drop in Book Club. If you've been listening to this series, you may well like to find that edition of Book Club in BBC Sounds. This is BBC Radio 4 Extra. And now we've our second offering from Denise Minor tonight as we continue her crime drama, The Dead Hour. Today, Paddy refuses to accept the police theory that the murder was committed by an ex-boyfriend. Middle of the afternoon, and already George Square was winter dark. 20 years without trial! Amnesty International. They gathered in front of the city chambers with candles every week to champion one of their list of prisoners. Somebody here would know something about Vary Burnett and Mark Thillingley. Mark up. Then don't work for them. You find another job for any member of my family. If the news see they can have a go at amnesty along the way, they will. 
I want to try and tell the real story. Go on. When did you last see Mark? He was here last week. Uh, how did he seem? Fine. Well, something must have happened between then and the night he died. Barry Burnett's murder. Lena, I want to find a killer. Well, it used to be an item, Barry and Mark. How long ago? Five years. Was Mark married then? Oh, no. But Barry and Mark were childhood sweethearts. Did she chuck him? Other way around, actually. He met Diana. Was, was, Ma was Mark ever violent? Violent? Mark? The police think he killed Barry, don't they? I don't. I don't think. This is BBC Radio 4 Extra. Now on BBC Radio 4 Extra, we continue Denise Miner's first true crime novel, which recreates the dark Glasgow underworld of the 1950s and the trial of the killer Peter Manuel, with repeated strong language. The respectable businessman William Watt is prepared to go to any lengths to persuade Manuel to take responsibility for the slaughter of Watt's family. The two men find themselves on a wild drinking spree with some of the city's most terrifying gangsters in hot pursuit. Liam Brennan reads The Long Drop. Tuesday, 3rd of December, 1957. The cellar under the cot bar is a place of legend. Women in their underwear serve you drink. Women dance naked or become naked? Men who'll never go to the cellar have heard rumours about it from other men who'll never go there. It's a small, dark room and costs a pound a head just to get in. Watt and Manuel park and get out of the car. Their eyes are wide. They nod to each other over and over, exaggerating their sexual engagement to the brink of pantomime. Peter Manuel is impotent. He can ejaculate when a woman is frightened enough, but he can't have normal relations. William Watt doesn't like sexy shows or stripping. He wouldn't go on his own. But they are prisoners of this macho convention, and there's no room for either of them to express anything but increasingly intense interest. The cellar is round the back, by the bins. Watt knocks on the steel door. The ice slot slides open, and a puffy-eyed man examines them as if he's looking for something. Watt holds up a five-pound note and smiles pleasantly. We're no buzzies, Manuel says, but the slit scrapes shut. There's nothing to do but wait. Did you give me a pound? asks Manuel, a smirk on his face. This is a threat. I'll say you gave me money. I'll renege on everything. But Watt is smiling too. You've sung that song already, chief, he says. A huge engine rumbles in the street beyond the wall. The engine cuts. Doors slam. They hear feet tramp towards them. All right, boys. Twisting around, they find Scout O'Neill and Shifty Thompson looking down at them. Scout has a plaster on the bridge of his burst nose and has changed his jacket. He half smiles. Moan fellas, time to go. They both know the jig is up. The door to the Gordon Club has a Georgian formality. It is glossy, black and ten foot tall, four steps up from the mucky street. The Gordon Club is on the second floor, above the Girl Guides headquarters. Everyone is wary as they get out of the car. This is not going to be nice. The Gordon Club is in the middle of everything. Within a half-mile radius are the courts, the corporation, the trades hall and the merchants' guild, three national newspapers and the police headquarters. Men with common interests meet in closed rooms and make deals, lend money, decide outcomes. But it's no place for the faint-hearted. It takes audacity to be part of this. Scout and Shifty flank the two men to the door. The hallway of the garden is red and pink, softly lit and filled with a smog of fresh cigar smoke. They pass the open double doors to the main room 
and catch sight of two catatonically drunk men in leather armchairs. Shifty leads them down the corridor to the very furthest door. He knocks twice, listens and opens it. Morris Dickov is at his large desk. He's in his shirt sleeves, working on a set of books. Dandy Mackay is standing next to him. Dickov stands up. He slaps the accounts book shut. He looks at the men. Gentlemen, he says softly, this is terribly awkward. Dickov is an underworld gentleman of the old-fashioned kind. He doesn't want to be in a golf club, or have a semi in the suburbs, or a bigger car than his neighbour. What Dickov wants is for everyone to be comfortable and have a pleasant evening and give them their money. He knows everyone worth knowing, their foibles and what they're good for. Mr Dickov was brought up by his grandparents, refugees from Bulgaria. He's Glaswegian but has retained some of their accent and conversational conventions. He calls children Darlink. Morris co-owns the Gordon Club with Dandy Mackay. Dandy's small and chubby, clean-shaven with a neat Tony Curtis haircut. He sports a puce handkerchief in his pocket and has a small green carnation in his buttonhole. But the main event is the tie. The tie is a swirl of what to Dandy appears to be muted shades of blue and yellow. It's actually red and blue with flecks of green. Dandy's colourblind, but no one has ever dared to tell him. Morris Dickov sighs heavily and asks William Watt, What do you think you are doing? I'm trying to speed things up, Watt says sheepishly. Don't. Watt shakes his head and speaks softly. Morris, when I paid for my wife, I, I didn't expect... Dickoff comes round the desk to Watt, who cowers. William, we are both businessmen. It is not easy to find a man for a task like that. I chose the wrong man for the job. It sounds so reasonable, Watt doesn't know what to say. Morris continues, his hands out. And I have asked you before. Let me fix this. You said yes. Now you're interfering with our plans. You have been recompensed with the land deal. A big deal. And now... Dickov opens his embrace towards Manuel and looks disappointed. This. Watt tries to explain. Morris, it's been over a year. It's, it, it's too long. Dickov is actually furious now. He raises his voice. This is decided. This is rare. Everyone is scared now, except Watt, because he's blacked out and wouldn't know trouble if it bit him in the arse. But Morris, Watt begins, you must understand, I, I've been disgraced. My, my business is... Nobody geese a fuck, William. Dickov's accent is no longer affected emigre. It's pure Shettleston. You want people to think you're a good guy? You want to think you're a good guy? You think you can pay us to kill your wife and still you're not responsible? We're clearing this up and you're pissing all over it. It's decided. No one says anything for a moment. It is in the pause that Manuel steps forward and speaks to Morris Dickov. His life has been a catalogue of impulsive errors, but this is the biggest mistake he'll ever make. I'm going to hang, he slurs. Why wouldn't I just tell them you have give me the job? Morris seems calm. He smiles pleasantly. He crosses his arms. You let yourself go in that house, Peter, didn't you? You did whatever little fancy came to mind. Well, now you pay. You hang. We will take your mother... We will rape and kill your mother. Manuel's mouth falls open. He looks as if he might cry. We will dump her bleeding naked corpse in the front garden of your pitiful home, says Morris, and your father will be found guilty of it. Manuel is afraid to breathe. 
Morris hasn't made the threat conditional yet, and he makes Manuel wait. Then he leans in. If you tell... Manuel knows Dikov means this. Dikov will find a man for the job, and he will pay him to indulge the worst of himself on Manuel's mother, just as Manuel did his worst on Watt's family. Dandy Mackay is watching this, and listening as his world collapses. Dandy's done dark things, bad things. He justifies them through a complex, fragile theology, all of this is shattered by Morris threatening to have someone's mother raped and killed. Suddenly, unexpectedly, he sees that the Gordon Club will end soon. Dandy will lose a lot of money and status because of Peter fucking Manuel. Abruptly, Dandy punches Manuel hard on the side of his head. He stumbles and the circle of Scout and Shifty close in around them. Manuel has his fists up, but only to block. He knows he can't hit back. Scout's eyes say, Sorry, pal, but I'm at work. Dandy punches Manuel again and again until he hits Manuel's cheekbone at an awkward angle and splits the skin on his knuckle. Dandy shakes his hand and huffs. He's angry about it. Scout waves Dandy back, offering to take over. Graciously, Dandy lets him. Scout giggles and smack hits Manuel on the side of the head, then on his ear. He short jabs Manuel's mouth. Blood bubbles up between Manuel's teeth. Manuel has taken beatings all of his life and knows when it's worth fighting back. He's taken much worse than this. No scout is being measured. He is hurting Manuel, but it's really only symbolic. Yes, darling, but do be careful, Dickov admonishes gently. He doesn't want his office smashed up. Sure, grins Scout, panting a little. The circle tightens around the beating. William Watt is out of the circle. He looks up and sees himself in a mirror over Dickov's desk. He looks like death. If he was dead, he would be with Marion, who knew him as no one else ever will. He didn't know what sort of man Dickov would send. He didn't know Vivian was there. She'd said she was going to Diana's house. He didn't know Margaret was there. He isn't responsible for what happened. He just got in with a bad, bad crowd. The beating has reached its natural end. They look to Dick off for direction and he nods. So, that's enough. No more of this. Dickoff gives Manuel a linen handkerchief to wipe the blood from his chin. He pats his arm. This is how it has to be. They all look at the damage Scout has done to Manuel's face. Scout wants to apologise, redress the balance of power between them, but Manuel is already down. An expression of sympathy would compound his disadvantage, so Scout leans in and whispers, Couldn't see your way to lend us five bob, could you, pal? Manuel laughs, spluttering blood onto Dickov's lovely rug. Scout laughs with him. Even Dandy chuckles a bit. Right, that's enough. Dickoff claps his hands together and raises a gentlemanly hand toward the door. Watt and Manuel head out and Dandy follows them. Scout calls, Cheerio! And Manuel grins back through his rapidly swelling lips. Dandy leads them to the stairs. He feels the cold morning coming and this whole glorious period of his life coming to an end. He had money and power and celebrity, but it's over. Dandy knows who is responsible. He goes for Manuel again, dragging him to the top step. He throws Peter down sideways. The sound of a bag of meat being rolled down stone steps echoes through the stairwell. The falling stops. Manuel doesn't groan, but Watt knows he isn't dead because he hears him panting. He scurries past Dandy, keeping to the far side of the stairs, lifts Manuel to his feet and gets him out onto the street. I'm fine, growls Manuel, his teeth clenched, blood bubbling on his lips. His knee buckles, but Watt holds him up. 
A taxi draws up and Watt opens the door without letting go of Manuel. I'm taking you home, Peter. It's the least I can do. Liam Brennan was reading The Long Drop by Denise Minor. The book was abridged by Sean Priest and produced by Ailey McCready. And tomorrow, Peter Manuel's murder trial reaches a critical stage as the High Court hears his disputed confessions. This is BBC Radio 4 Extra. And now we've our second offering from Denise Minor, a thriller set in Glasgow in 1984, where a leading female lawyer has been murdered. The following day, her former... 50s, Manuel is on trial for eight brutal murders, including the cold-blooded slaughter of three female members of the Watt family. The reader is Liam Brennan. Monday, 19th of May, 1958. Manuel gave detailed confessions to all eight murders, but he's pled not guilty in court. This is Manuel's story. Anne is in his co-bride, waiting for the bus home, when a man walks out of the dark. She calls out to him. Tommy? No, he says. I'm not Tommy. My name is Peter. He joins her at the bus stop and they fall to talking. She tells him she's just been stood up by a soldier she met at a dance last week. She's fed up. Ah, never mind, he says. Everyone gets dizzied sometimes. What age are you? Seventeen, she says. You're young, he says. Don't take it so serious. When her bus comes, he gets on and sits a few seats behind her. Four stops later, he gets off when she does. Oh, you getting off here too? Yes. They're pals by then. Well, I'm off this way, she says, and remembers her manners. Nice to meet you. He looks over the golf course. It's a bit dark for a girl alone, he says. I'll walk you over. So they climb a stile and walk onto the dark golf course. Anne screams and claws at his face, scratching three long welts in his left cheek. No, he doesn't know why she did that. It sort of came out of nowhere. Then she runs away from him. He runs after her to the dike, the one by the burn. It's steep. He can see the slide marks on the muddy banks where she went down. She's lost a kitten heel shoe. He looks down the dike and sees her running along it. She gets out the other side and runs to a wooded area. He follows, climbs out. She's hiding. He knows she is. He slides behind a tree and stills. He waits, breathless, listening. A branch moves somewhere nearby, a step, a twig snapping. She creeps out of a bush. He lets her take a few steps into the open. He lets her hope. Then he runs out. She's screaming quite loud and runs through the undergrowth and doesn't see the discarded barbed wire until she's stuck on it. She screams. He wants her to stop screaming, but she doesn't. He picks up a bit of metal from the ground and hits her head with it. Yes, it was a few times. Quite a few times. He had to hit hard to stop the screaming. Manuel has made three different confessions on the same night in Hamilton Police Station. The confessions are typed by cops and then signed by Peter Manuel. The confessions are given to Detective Inspector Robert McNeil of Glasgow and to Chief Inspector William Munsey, the South Lanarkshire cop who hates Manuel more than anyone else in the world. Munsey has been pursuing Manuel for 12 years since he first arrested him for housebreaking and sexual assault. Munsey always gets his man. Manuel's first confession is a promise to help with certain matters. His second confession is a promise to help them solve the murders of Anne Neelands, Isabel Cook, the Watts and the Smarts. His third is many pages long. It is a detailed narrative account of the things he's done. Isabel Cook Just over the bridge at Burnt Broom I met a girl walking. I dragged her into a field. I made her watch as I put stones in her handbag and threw it into a burn. She started to scream. 
I tore off her clothes and tied something round her neck and choked her. I picked her up and took her to a field. I dug a hole and buried her. The description of the Watt murders tells how Manuel crept along the dark street and approached the house, how he smashed the window and slid his hand in to open the door, how quiet it was, and about the picture of the dog and chiffonier and the mascaro dry gin and the sandwich, and the women, pop, 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 pop. He tells them how he broke into the Smart's house on New Year's morning and found the family in their beds, how he shot the boy first. He didn't know it was a child. He thought it was a small man. In the confession, he tells them how he got the Webley and the Beretta and from who. He admits wrapping up both the Webley and the Beretta and dropping them in the Clyde by the suspension bridge. It takes a team of divers two weeks of raking through sludge in the freezing brown water to find them. Finally, when they bring them up, the guns are wrapped just as Manuel described, the Webley in a pair of his own sister's gloves, the Beretta in a scrap of cloth from the Smart's house. Manuel gave these confessions but now refutes them. He instructs his counsel, Harold Leslie, to argue against their admission in court on the grounds of police fraud. They typed things he did not say and then signed on his behalf. As evidence for this, he points out that each confession is signed by a different hand and the name varies. The first is signed Peter Manuel. The second, Peter Anthony Manuel. The third one is signed P.T. Manuel. Harold Leslie refuses to present this argument in court because it's stupid. Any cop who was attempting fraud would be careful to keep their signature consistent over three documents signed in a six-hour period. Harold Leslie does argue against them being admitted, but only on the grounds that his client had no access to a solicitor for 48 hours after his arrest and hadn't slept for two days. His father was arrested when they came for Peter. A pair of gloves from a burglary were found in his dresser and he refused to say they came from his son. The arrest of Samuel was solely for the purpose of putting pressure on his son. Lord Cameron hears Leslie's arguments but rules that the confessions be admitted into evidence. They're shown to the jury. The next morning the court reassembles. Peter Manuel waits until the jury are in. Lord Cameron is seated and the public are all there and settled. He likes an audience. Then he asks to confer with his counsel. The discussions are intense but inaudible. Leslie nods solemnly and seems to ask Manuel for confirmation again and again. Manuel gives it. Harold Leslie asks permission to approach the bench and informs Lord Cameron that Manuel has just sacked Mr Grieve and himself. Mr Leslie's final act as counsel is to inform the court that Mr Manuel wants to represent himself in the case from now on. As his first action, Manuel moves to recall several witnesses. The first witness he wants to recall is William Watt. He also wants to call both of his parents to the stand. Tuesday, 3rd of December, 1957. Watt and Manuel sit in the Vauxhall Velox on the Birkinshaw housing scheme. At the end of 4th Street, the Manuel's chimney is awake. Peter's mother is up already, warming the kitchen, making the breakfast. It is 6am, December dark, and the inside of the car is so cold that condensation settles in the dashboard chrome. Yet what and Manuel linger? Neither wants the astounding night to be over. They're both nostalgic for it already, here on the threshold of the end. To waste time, Manuel takes his cigarettes out of his inside pocket and taps the packet on his knee, knocking a single cigarette up. It's a good trick. It impresses people. He saw it in a movie and practised and practised until he perfected it. Watt gives a fond, drunken smile at the trick. Manuel puts the cigarette between his lips but doesn't reach for the door handle and now they both understand that he'll stay in the car until he's finished smoking it. 
they're both pleased at the reprieve. They hear the tramp of work boots behind them coming up the quiet street. Manuel watches in the side mirror. An older man in a jacket and bonnet, a muffler and overalls, carrying his lunch tin under his arm. He sees that Manuel is looking at him and drops his gaze passing the car. It's the father, Conley. Three daughters. The oldest daughter married two weeks ago. Manuel remembers seeing the scrammel outside the house. His mother will know them from the chapel. Manuel tried to marry once. She was decent. He takes another draw in his cigarette. She was decent and clean. Manuel didn't know if he loved her, but he felt something strong about her. She reminded him of his mother. Peter wrote anonymous poison pen letters to her, warning her off Peter Manuel. He is a beast and has a dark past. You can do better. Peter still doesn't know why he did that. It bothers him. Watt turns to Manuel, smiling drunkenly. We're going in for a wee cup of tea. Manuel looks across the garden to the window into his parents' front room. His mother's face bobs to the surface. Bridget steps back, swallowed by the shadows again, but she's seen the car and knows he's there. No. Come on, Peter, I need a cup of tea. Watt has the car door open, leans back in the seat to lever himself out. No! Manuel grabs his arm. No! Their eyes meet. They're both surprised that Manuel expressed an emotion. He's breaking character. No. Manuel corrects his tone. Watt is looking at the window too and saw Bridget's face. Was that your mother? Manuel stubs his cigarette out in the car's brimming ashtray. She's seen you in the papers. Watt looks sad. You won't have me in your home. Manuel rubs the salt in gently. I hardly can, Bill. It's my family. Watt pretends he doesn't care. Ha! <laughs> he retorts. He opens the glove box in the middle of the dashboard and takes out a leather hip flask. This is good stuff. The smell of peat fills the car. Watt drinks from the flask, smiling, then not smiling, remembering what Manuel has done for him, taken for him, what happened at the Gordon. He stops drinking. He swallows. He looks away as he hands the flask to Manuel. It's a peace pipe. Manuel sucks a tut between his teeth and snatches the flask, drinking it all for spite. It wasn't piss whiskey in the hip flask. It was an old blend, unexpectedly strong. Now Manuel feels sick, but he can't complain of nausea because hard men don't feel a wee bit sick. He hopes he won't spew. Peter. Manuel looks at Watt's saying sorry eyes. He tuts and looks away. It wasn't my decision, pleads Watt. I didn't even know you then. Manuel cannot talk about this any more. He gets out of the car, chucking his burning cigarette away and swaggering around the back of the car he's sure he's going to be sick. He opens the gate like a housewife and shuffles through. It takes so many tippy-tappy wee steps to get through. He hates that. Hates to be seen to do that. He doesn't look up for a last sighting of Watt, but steps in through the front door with one stride, knowing Watt is watching him. He stands in the dark hallway of his house, his back to the cool plaster wall. He hears his mother at work in the kitchen. He hears creaks from upstairs as his brother swings his feet over the edge of the bed, as his sister steps across the room upstairs, and he's glad he didn't let Watt come in here. To his family. Liam Brennan was reading The Long Drop by Denise Minor. The book was abridged by Sham Priest and produced by Ailey McCready. And there's more tomorrow night at 9.30. 
This is BBC Radio 4 Extra. Another thriller from Denise Miner now, The Dead Hour. Tonight, the reporter, Paddy Meehan, has a one-night stand with a policeman and falls out with her night shift driver. Killer Peter Manuel in this true crime story set in Glasgow's underworld of dark deeds and with repeated strong language. As the case continues, Manuel has sacked his legal team and is conducting his own defence. Liam Brennan is the reader. Monday, 26th of May, 1958. Peter Manuel has called his mother as a witness. Bridget Manuel is a small woman with salt and pepper hair tied at the nape of her neck. She's tucked her crucifix inside her blouse because she knows most of the people here are Protestants. She doesn't want to offend anyone. She's been awake all night praying for the strength to do the right thing. When she swears by Almighty God to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, she means every word. She means it unconditionally. Peter is standing in the court, looking up at her. He looks well and healthy and confident. Very formally, he asks his mother to identify herself by name and address, and she does. I believe, he says, you're also my mother. He flashes her a fond, wry smile. Bridget smiles back. I am, she says softly. Taking the confessions from the productions table, Peter shows her the signature on each of them. Do these look like my signature? She says his writing is usually very neat, and in this particular one, the signature goes over the line. That's unusual for him. Does anything strike you about the variations in the signatures? P.T. Manuel, Peter Anthony Manuel, and so on. Would you say they're the signature of the same man? She knows what he's trying to make her say, but she can't. She holds his eye and tilts her head softly and says, she has no way of knowing that. Could a policeman have signed these instead of me? Bridget wants to say the police are to blame, but that isn't true. I don't believe they could have, she says quietly. I'm not sure they'd know your confirmation name is Anthony. Manuel flinches. He doesn't want his confirmation name discussed in court. Confirmation is a sacrament for Catholic children. Catholic children choose a saint's name for themselves, a saint they hope to emulate, or for whom they feel a special devotion. Peter Manuel was ten when he chose St Anthony, the patron saint of lost people. Two years later, he was convicted of stealing a collection box from a Catholic chapel. He moves on to asking his mother about the night he was arrested. Bridget and Samuel are driven to Hamilton Police Station. D.I. Robert McNeil and William Muncie are there. Peter is sitting in the middle of a green-tiled room on a low chair. His hands are behind the chair. Cuffed, thinks Bridget. He looks up, sees her, and sighs. McNeil steps forward. Come on now, Peter. You asked to see your parents. Don't you have something to tell them? Peter keeps his eyes down and shakes his head like a drunk. McNeil is exasperated. We've gone to a lot of trouble to bring them here. Peter lifts a hand and runs his fingers through his hair. She sees now that he isn't handcuffed to the chair. He was assuming a pose, like in a film. Bridget steps back. She is a fool who falls for his lies every time. She says, Look, Peter, what is it you want to talk to us about? But Bridget knows what it is. He looks at her and sees that she knows. Silently, she starts to cry. Peter whispers, I, d I don't know why I do these terrible things. Oh, Peter. She holds his hands and kisses them. She kisses them so that she doesn't have to look up at him. And then she does. He's looking at her, and then at his father. His face is the mask of a man who's crying. 
but his eyes are dry. Standing in the dock now, with all the eyes of the world boring into her, Bridget relates the cold facts of who was where and when. She only adds one bit of illuminating dialogue. You said that you didn't know what made you do these terrible things. Peter freezes, one hand in his notes. Are you sure? Yes, she says. She is. He nods as if he understands and forgives her mistake. Is it possible that you misheard me say that? No, Peter, she says, her voice unwavering. I heard you say that. Peter is very obviously annoyed and Bridget cowers. They are all afraid of Peter's temper. A domestic terrorist, he controls the house with his moods. Did you hear me say it? Or is it just an instance where you think you heard me saying it? Her voice is quiet. I heard it, Peter. He raises a threatening eyebrow. He huffs a bitter laugh. She has a desperate need to calm him down, offer tea, give him money to go out, put the wireless on to distract him, but they're in court. It occurs to her that maybe she doesn't need to calm him down anymore. He isn't coming home. As if he can feel her slipping the leash, he raises his voice and tries again. Did you definitely and plainly hear me saying, I don't know what makes me do these things? Bridget's panic rises to a pitch. Her son is shouting at her to recant, and still she says, I did. Peter glares at her. Bridget sees the darkness there, worse than ever. If he gets out, he will kill her. Tuesday, 14th of January, 1958. It is a month and a half since Watt and Manuel spent the night carousing together. It's eight days since the Smart's bodies were discovered. Peter Manuel has been in Hamilton Police Station for 14 hours. Finally, he's taken to an interview room. D.I. Goodall and William Muncy come in. They sit down opposite him. Goodall is CID, a city cop, Muncy's country, local to Lanarkshire. They're having to work together, and neither one is pleased about it. D.I. Goodall acts calm and neutral. He's tall and sallow-skinned. Chief Inspector Muncy is a beefy, square-jawed man. He hates chaos and disorder and things not going the way he wants. But most of all, he hates Manuel. Muncy hates Manuel because he stubs cigarettes out on the arms of chairs. He eats his victim's food and grinds it into the carpet. He desecrates the houses he's broken into. Goodall says, You were seen driving away from Sheepburn Road on New Year's morning by an eyewitness. I wasn't alone. Goodall sits up. Muncy clears his throat. Who was with you? Now Peter is in charge, and they're listening to him. I was with someone. He asked me to help him scout the area for houses to break into. Goodall and Muncy look at each other. Goodall asks, Peter, do you think you could pick this man out of a line-up? It is 10.30 at night. Five men standing in a row, a drunk, a cop and three other people. Manuel walks sombrely along the line and stops at the flurry of colour and patterns. He puts his hand on Dandy Mackay's shoulder. Muncy, eyes shining, barks, Are you alleging that this man asked you to show him the bungalow in Sheepburn Road for the purposes of housebreaking? I am, says Manuel. Dandy is angry. The fuck I did! I'm Dandy McFucking Kai. Fuck am I doing stealing jewellery for bungalows? Do you own a gun, Mr Mackay? Say, for example, a Beretta Automatic? It's an incendiary question. A Beretta has been mentioned in the papers with regard to the smart murders. Dandy understands the implication. Me? His voice rises to a roar. Me own a Beretta? Muncie smiles. 
Would you know anyone who does own a Beretta? Dandy reads Muncie's expression. It takes a minute for him to get the prompt, but then... Aye, I do. Are you indicating Mr Manuel? Aye, he owns a fucking Beretta. Goodle is smirking at Manuel. Do you have any idea where Mr Manuel might have got that gun from? Dandy looks Manuel in the eye and shouts... For me, he's bought a Beretta for me. Muncie is loving this. Would you be willing to testify to that fact, Mr Mackay? Aye, I would. Goodall offers Mackay the exit door, but Dandy turns to Manuel, widening his legs into a boxing stance. Goodall shouts, No! and lunges in to stop it, but then he pulls back. He's a Glasgow cop. He can't touch Dandy Mackay. He shouts, Not the face, Mr Mackay! They can't appear in court with an accused with a sore face. Not in a case this big. Dandy punches Manuel's chest, his throat. Smack in the gut. Manuel is bent double, struggling to get air back into his chest, drawing shallow, squeaky little breaths. Dandy stands tall. This is the beating he meant to give him at the Gordon Club. Goodall and four uniformed cops take Peter back to the cell. He's left alone in the cold stone. No one will speak to him. Manuel is a famous talker. Silence is torturous for him. And they know it is. Finally, at midnight, he says he wants to confess. He wants to talk to McNeil. At 2.15am, he's taken to a bleak interview room. He's shoved into a lone chair in the middle of the room. Five uniformed cops line the wall. Peter speaks to them. I know you, don't I? Nothing. Or uh, is it your sister I know? They don't even look at him. Two stand by the door. One sits against the wall, reading the daily record. Manuel sits there for an hour, thinking... D.I. Goodall and D.I. Robert McNeil come in. Hello again, Peter. They give him tea. They give him cigarettes. What did you want to see us about then, Peter? I'll confess to everything if you bring my parents here. Everyone is slightly stunned. Everything. Manuel lists them quietly. Smarts, Watts, Isabel Cook, and Neelan's. But I want to see my parents now. Now? asks Goodall. It's the middle of the night. Now, says Manuel. Before they arrive, Manuel gives a vague confession, referring to certain matters. It's not detailed enough to be of any legal use. Goodall points this out, so Manuel gives a second confession, addressed to McNeil, numbering the crimes he will solve. One... Anne Neelands, two, the Watt murders, three, Isabel Cook, four, the Smart murders. He signs it and McNeil reads it. No, they need details, for God's sake, Manuel. A general statement simply won't do. Manuel talks to Muncie and then signs a detailed narrative confession. There's one thing left to do. Tell us where Isabel Cook is buried. I can't. Manuel smiles up at them. I'm tired and I'm cold, he says. Cuff the bastard, barks Muncie. Get the cars. We're going out to Burnt Broom. He'll walk us to her. And we'll hear how that goes tomorrow at 9.30. Liam Brennan was reading The Long Drop by Denise Minor. The book was abridged by Sean Priest and produced by Ailey McCready. This is BBC Radio 4 Extra. And it's time now for part eight of our other story of Denise Miners that we've been hearing over the last week and a half. In the dead hour, we're again in Glasgow. This...
Tuesday, 27th of May, 1958. William Watts is in the witness hall, waiting to be called back into court. It's morning. He hasn't been able to eat since he heard he would have to appear again and be questioned by Manuel. Dowdle hasn't even briefed him for this court appearance. There's no point. Anything could happen. Dowdle has reassured them. The jury can't bring themselves to look straight at Manuel. Dowdle thinks that means Peter will hang. It's a sure sign. The door opens and the Macer's face appears. Mr. Watt? Manuel is standing at Harold Leslie's place, at a table in the well of the court. He has stacks of papers in front of him. He looks smart and able and plausible. In the lower stalls, among the journalists and lawyers, Dandy Mackay and Maurice Dickov sit in the front row. They deliberately catch Watt's eye as he passes. Careful, their faces warn. As William Watt gets sworn in again, his hands and feet are cold. He feels faint. He sees Manuel come round the table, undo the buttons on his jacket, pull it back to rest his hand on his hip, look at papers. The jury are looking straight at him. They shouldn't be. Mr Watts, Manuel begins, do you remember meeting me in a restaurant in Renfield Street? Whitehall's, I believe, is the name of that establishment. Watt has never heard Peter Manuel talk like that. Even his accent sounds different. I do, he says soberly. Manuel asks if Watt recalls the conversation which took place between Mr Watt and himself. Watt blusters. Well, there was a very great deal of conversation during the time we were there. He attempts a smile at the court feels his lips and cheeks sliding around in smile-suggesting ways. He knows he hasn't pulled it off. The press look back at him, blank. The women on the balcony are staring at him, mouths agape. Everyone here hates him. But then Marion's voice comes into his head, so strongly and clearly that it makes him want to cry. Don't be silly, Bill. This isn't about being liked. It's business. You've just been silly, aren't you? Do you or don't you remember our conversation? Uh, yes, Watt tells his dead wife, Marion. Do you recall, in particular, part of the conversation in which you professed yourself agreeably surprised by meeting me? Watt tuts. <laughs> Most certainly not. Manuel says suddenly, do you recall describing to me the manner in which you killed your wife? Watt is winded. He struggles to draw breath, and when he does, his voice is faint. I, ne I, ne I never did anything of the kind. Manuel looks disappointed at the answer. Do you remember telling me that it was never your intention to kill your daughter? I did not say that. Do you remember telling me that after you had shot your little girl, Vivian, it would have taken very little effort to turn the gun on yourself. No, I don't, because I never said it. Manuel nods, as if this is just as he suspected. He turns a page in the notes, denoting a change of pace. You have already appeared here before the court, Mr Watt, and you alleged that I described certain articles of furniture in the interior of your house to you. You knew every stick of furniture in the place. It was uncanny. Manuel smirks. When you last gave evidence, you made a statement on oath that I told you there was no safe in your house. Yet is it feasible that I would make detailed notes about the furniture and furnishings but fail to note that there was a safe in the kitchen? What shrugs? It wasn't a question. Manuel thinks he's being clever. Does it not in fact prove that I was never in your house, Mr Watt? No, it doesn't. Watt is right. Not noticing a safe doesn't mean you haven't been in someone's house. Manuel looks thrown by that. He doesn't really understand the art of adversarial legal questioning. He's watched it often enough and knows it looks like a fight without shouting or hitting, but it is infinitely more complex. It isn't just point scoring. 
Manuel is getting it wrong. He's angry about that, and his voice changes. Mr. Watt, you killed your family, didn't you? No. Watt is comfortable. I did not. I did not kill my family. Well, says Manuel, a nasty edge to his voice, did you ask someone else to kill your family? Dickov and Dandy sit forward in tandem, and William Watt thinks of Mrs. Manuel's picture in the papers. He's not surprised at Manuel doing this to his mother, but he's sad for her. No, Watt's voice falters, I did not. Did you pay someone to kill your family for you? Watt looks at Peter, trying to read him. No, he says heavily, I did not. Manuel holds his eye and takes a deep breath. Watt thinks he's going to shout. He's going to betray his mother. He's going to get raped and killed. Watt braces himself. That'll be all, Mr Watt, you can get down. Manuel and Watt look at each other. He hasn't. He won't. Dickov and Mackay sit back in their chairs. Manuel has saved his mother's life. Peter and William both feel sad that it had to be him. It was always going to end here. Tuesday, 27th of May, 1958. It's the finale. Peter Manuel is going to give evidence on his own behalf. He gets up, unbuttons his jacket and almost runs up to the witness box. He's excited. He's been waiting to do this for a long time. And now... They will get to know the real him. They will see other possible Peter. Manuel talks for six hours, largely without notes. He tells all the stories of each of the murders individually. As he does this, he recalls witness statements, word for word, stages small vignettes, recounts dialogue. Ten minutes into the six-hour monologue, everyone in the courtroom knows that Manuel has made a catastrophic mistake. He should not be speaking. Peter Manuel does not know how other people feel. He can read a face and see signs that tell him if someone is frightened or laughing, but there is no reciprocation. He feels no small echo of what his listener is feeling. Anne Neelands wasn't him. Sure, he says, a witness claims to have seen him in East Co-Bride that night, but they couldn't have seen him because he wasn't there. The police were all over him at the time, searching his house, confiscating his clothes, bothering him, bothering his mother. He moves on to the Isabel Cook murder and reads out the charge. Well, Manuel didn't do that murder. He wasn't there. He didn't know where the body was. Goodall and Muncie knew where it was buried all along and they just took him there in the middle of the night and said he'd told them where it was. He doesn't say anything compassionate about Isabel or Anne, two dead 17-year-old girls. To him, they're no more than skin-covered stage flats in a play about him. Next he talks about the Watt murders. He tells the court he met Watt in Whitehalls and Watt was so impressed by Peter that he invited him drinking. Watt admitted everything to him. He told Peter that he drove back from Cairnban overnight and killed his own family. He didn't know his wife's sister would be there, but she was, so he shot her too. He meant to tie up his daughter, not kill her. Watt just meant to tie her up and then she would get free the next morning. It doesn't occur to Manuel that Vivian Watt would recognise her own father while he tied her up. Jury members look at each other and shrug. They wonder why Lord Cameron is letting him say this stuff. But Lord Cameron's job is to ensure that Peter Manuel is heard fairly and thoroughly, not that he is dissuaded from talking utter shite. Moving on to the Smart murders, Manuel tells everyone that he'd been a friend of Mr Smart's for a long time. Mr Smart had both respect and deference for Peter Manuel, because Peter helped him when he was building his house. Just before New Year, Mr Smart asked Peter to help him buy an illegal gun. 
prowlers had been seen in the area and he wanted to protect his family. The two men met in the Royal Oak on New Year's Eve. When Manuel handed over the Beretta, Mr Smart was so pleased that he gave Manuel £15 in brand new sequentially numbered notes. Then, ah, oh, Mr Smart remembered that a business associate, Mr Brown, was coming to call while the Smarts were away for New Year. Could Peter take this key to the family home and meet Mr Brown there and explain, Mr Smart isn't here. Mr Smart will leave out a bottle of whisky for Peter to give to Mr Brown. In the bungalow, Peter found three bottles of whisky on the sideboard and a bottle of sherry. He noticed that the house was in some disarray, and it occurred to him that maybe the Smarts had not gone on holiday after all. He went down the hall. He opened Michael Smart's bedroom door and saw someone in the bed. He went to Mr and Mrs Smart's bedroom and saw that they were asleep in bed, so he put on the lights. It was then that he saw blood everywhere. They were both dead, and Mr Smart had the Beretta in his hand. Mr Smart had killed his son and his wife and then turned the gun on himself. Realising that the gun was traceable to him, and not wanting to be implicated, Manuel got a pair of gloves and went around wiping his prints from anything he might have touched inside the house. Then he took the Smart's car and drove off and dropped the Beretta on the Clyde by the suspension bridge. That's why he was able to tell the cops where the gun was. Manuel lies like a child, adding bits on, making narrative addendums when he realises that his story makes no sense, and then, and then, and then. He's spinning lies and then abandoning them. He's halfway through a lie when he switches back, or forgets. The police are dumb. Everyone confides in Peter. He gives himself all the good lines and even stops to chortle at his own quips. The jury hate him. The jury hate him not just because he's killed lots of people, but for telling them such a stupid story. A bad story is annoying, but a very bad story is insulting. Does he think they're stupid? Is he stupid? Well, he clearly isn't stupid. He's very something but they don't know what it is. There's something really wrong with them. Manuel feels none of this. He is other possible Peter and thinks the jury are as entranced by him as he is by himself. Other Peter is having a lovely time, talking, talking, talking. For the first time in his life, he feels heard. After six hours of other possible Peter, Everyone in the court wants him dead. The jury have no qualms. The lawyers feel he has tried himself. This is his first capital case, but Lord Cameron knows that if it comes to donning the black tricorn, it will cause him no sleepless nights. Peter Manuel doesn't feel what they feel. Manuel thinks that went quite well. Liam Brennan was reading The Long Drop by Denise Minor. The book was abridged by Sean Priest and produced by Ailey McCready. And tomorrow the verdicts are due to be returned in the last episode of Denise Minor's Reimagining and Abroad, but concentrating in the first programme on Round the Horn. This is BBC Radio 4 Extra. Next, we've got the concluding part of a former book at bedtime, Denise Miner's award-winning true crime story, The Long Drop. At the end of the trial of the serial killer, Peter Manuel, Glasgow holds its breath as the verdicts come in. The reader is Liam Brennan. Thursday, 29th of May, 1958. Who speaks for you? asks the clerk of the judiciary. The foreman of the jury stands up. Have you reached your verdict? He nods, takes out his glasses, curling the wire frames around his ears. He reads out the verdict. Guilty. 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 Not guilty. 
The foreman reads out the full verdict. The murder of Anne Neelands we found not proven. The murders of the Watts, the Smarts and Isabel Cook we found pursuant to theft. The clerk writes the verdict in a large book. Transcription takes a full four minutes. While he writes, no one in the courtroom speaks. The city outside freezes. No one is waiting for the verdict. They're waiting for the sentence. M.G. Gillies stands up and asks the court to pass sentence on charges 4, 6 and 7, the murder verdicts. Lord Cameron nods. Then he speaks to the room, but his eyes are on Manuel, standing in the dock. It is the sentence of this court that you be taken from this place to the prison of Berlin, Glasgow, there to be detained until the 19th of June next, and upon that day, between the hours of 8 and 10 o'clock, you suffer death by hanging. Lord Cameron reaches down to a special shelf below his desk, lifts a black tricorn hat with two hands, holds it over his head, and recites the legal formulation that makes the sentence binding. This is pronounced for doom. He lifts the hat away from his head, a coronation in reverse. As he does, there is a scurry in the dock. The public leap to their feet and look down. All they see is the last police officer vanishing down the spiral staircase to the cells below. All they hear is feet running on stone stairs. The public bray with fury, robbed of their chance to heckle. In the stone hall outside, fifty journalists race for the four public phones by the door. The story rolls out to the street. The thousand people who are waiting to hear have been standing in blustery May rain. Many of them have been waiting all day. Now the doors to the court fly open, and the journalists who lost the sprint to the phone boxes race down to the street, yanking their coats on. The mobs surge across the salt market to them, blocking the road. The journalists shout the verdict to fend them off. Guilty, 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 not guilty. He'll hang in a month. The triumphant roar can be heard over a mile away. Press photographers are snapping bulbs at the crowd. A television camera is mounted on a trailer in front of the court. It is the first criminal case ever reported on Scottish television. Far out on the Argyle coast, the news reaches Bridget Manuel, sitting on a bed in a dark hotel room. She cradles a small plaster statue of St Anthony that she brought with her from the house, and weeps as her husband hangs up the phone. Friday, 30th of May, 1958. The day after he is found guilty, his father and mother are allowed to visit Peter in the Deputy Governor's office at Berlin. Both Bridget and Samuel expect him to be angry, but he isn't. Peter is excited. His mood is up. He wants to talk about the trial. He grandstands about Lord Cameron's conduct of the case, his rambling about his lawyer and the possibility of his appeal, and how the van from the court wasn't very safe, and he should have had a seatbelt if they were going to drive at that sort of speed. He stops for breath. He looks at his parents, waiting for them to react. Samuel can't think what to say. Bridget looks at his fine, square face, an echo of his father as a younger man. Peter won't be home tonight. She asks God to forgive her for feeling so glad. They meet their son three more times before he dies. The second and third visits are uneventful. The last time they meet is different. Two days before the execution date, they wait in the governor's office. Peter comes shuffling in, white saliva crusted at the side of his mouth. Two officers guide him to his chair. They sit him down. Peter's eyes are unfocused. His hands are trembling on his knees. The drool from his mouth begins to foam, bubbles gathering at the side of his lips. He's acting. Bridget is instantly furious with him. She says his name. He doesn't react. She says it again. Nothing. She reminds him that this may well be the last time they ever see each other in this life. Peter? Peter? 
Peter. She shouts his name. Nothing. Not a spark of recognition. But even a madman can hear shouting. Bridget does what she would never dare to do if they weren't in a prison. She slaps him. Still nothing. She grabs his hair and tugs it hard. Messing his hair is the one thing that will always send Peter into a rage. Nothing. The prison officers aren't stepping in either. They want her to hit him. Peter stares forward, but she can see he is angry from the hooding of his eyes. She sits down and, weeping, speaks to him in a monotone. My knees are broken with praying for you. I fed and clothed you and you did nothing but hurt me. And still you hurt me. When I saw you go out that door, I never knew what harm you would do. And still I kept you in my heart and my home. I loved you and you never gave me a spark of love back. You did nothing but shame me and mock me. You have broken my heart, you vicious, godless man. She waits for him to say something. She waits, but he does nothing. She stands up without permission from her husband or the officers or her son. She stands and says, So, goodbye. She doesn't try to touch him anymore. She is glad to get out to the open air. Samuel comes hurrying after her. Perhaps the boy is really ill. Bridget just looks at Samuel through her tears and thinks, He's an Egypt. He's a lion, effing Egypt. And he's kinky in the SEX department. But she's married to him. So be it. She stares at him. He reaches for her hand and she barks, Don't you touch me. Don't you touch me ever again. Friday, 11th of July, 1958. Capital punishment will soon be abolished. Peter Manuel will be the third to last person ever hanged in Scotland. In the meantime, attempts are made to meet the complaints of abolitionists and the practice has changed. Scotland uses the long drop method. It is as clean as hanging gets and resolves the two main pitfalls the head being pinched from the body like a grape from the stalk, or slow strangulation. The long drop method snaps the neck between the second and third vertebrae. Done properly, death is instantaneous. It is a careful calculation of weight, height and muscle tone. Manuel was weighed and measured when he first came to Berlini. His food intake and physical size is monitored so that they don't have to weigh him again. It would be obvious what they were weighing him for. That would be inhumane. The trouble starts the day before his appeal against the death sentence. Peter begins frothing at the mouth and fitting. He's rushed to the infirmary and his stomach is pumped. They find nothing. For a week he twitches and is mute, froths and stares. He still eats, though. He still smokes. The day before his execution... He stops the act. I feel better, he says. He has no memory of the past two weeks, but remembers that the appeal was due to happen then. Did it happen? Yes, Peter, it did. You were at the court. What happened? You lost by unanimous, son. It's happening tomorrow. No. See, what happened was P.O. Sullivan hit me in the head a week ago, I've had a massive head injury. I I wasn't fit to plead. We need a second appeal. Manuel is examined by two prison doctors. They find a mark on his scalp, but it looks as if he scratched it there himself. This is the day before the execution date. Bridget Manuel has submitted a petition to the court to delay her son's hanging. But there will be no second appeal, because the two Harrys are already in the prison. Harry Allen and his assistant, Harry Smith, professional hangman, 
long drop method men. That night, Manuel doesn't sleep. He stays awake all night, listening to the radio and smoking, chatting. At 5am he eats chips and drinks a pint of strong tea. At 7.20am, Father Smith comes in and asks to take his confession. Manuel says no, but lets Father Smith pray for him. At three seconds to eight, the two Harrys come into his cell. In complete but companionable silence, they bind his wrists behind his back and lead him across the corridor. Harry Allen fits the noose and the hood, while Harry Smith ensures the witnesses are standing clear. Smith pulls the lever. The trap door swings. Second and third vertebrae are separated. From the moment the Harrys walked into the condemned cell, it takes eight seconds. Peter Manuel is dead. At the moment of Manuel's death, groups of people gather all around the city. They stand in silence and watch the sky. They gather in streets outside his parents' house. They stand at bus stops, on train platforms, looking up at the sky, waiting for something to lift. The moment passes. It starts to rain. Trains move off. Buses arrive. Crowds disperse. Immediately, the children begin to tell each other that Peter Manuel could see in the dark. Three months later, William Watt gives an interview to the press. He invites the city to celebrate with him on the occasion of his engagement to his young fiancée, Femi. He expects people will be pleased for him after all his troubles. Three years later, the value of commercial property is reassessed by Glasgow Corporation surveyors. They find it has tripled in value and blame changing conditions and the commercial boom. Strangely, landowners do not protest the rate rises that follow from this. The land is quietly bought at these heightened valuations by the corporation and then levelled for redevelopment. The Gorbals is flattened. Kirkadens is flattened. The city is reborn so completely that it becomes a memory of a memory of a place. Everything goes back to normal. Peter Manuel becomes a scary story people tell each other. Just a story. Just a creepy story about a serial killer. Liam Brennan was reading The Long Drop by Denise Minor. It was abridged by Sean Priest, and the producer was Ailey McCready. This is BBC Radio 4 Extra. Well, now it's time for The Dead Hour, also written by Denise Minor. And tonight, Paddy tackles the killer just as he's about to strike again. <laughs> 